Hello, welcome to an interpretation and brief overview of shoulder x-rays. A systematic approach is necessary when reviewing any x-ray. Therefore, we need to ascertain whether the patient data and position of the x-ray are appropriate for interpretation. A systematic approach is necessary when interpreting any x-ray. Therefore, we need to identify the position of the normal anatomical structures. First, we start with the humeral shaft, then we move across to the humeral head. Then, we look at the acromioclavicular joint, the clavicle, the scapula, and the ribs. With assessing the humeral shaft, we need to ensure that the soft tissue surrounding the diaphysis or shaft is continuous and has no pathological features. Then we assess the shaft for periosteal reactions. We ensure that the periosteum is continuous around the entire border of the humerus. Then we assess the cortex. The cortex needs to be continuous with consistent density and thickness. Then we need to look at the medullary canal. Once again, we assess for density, consistency, and for any intraosseous lesions. Then we move on to assessing the humeral head or epiphysis. First, we assess the general alignment with the glenoid cavity. Then, we assess the greater tuberosity. We then look at and identify the lesser tuberosity, and we also assess the articular surface of the humeral head. Having assessed the articular surface of the humeral head, we need to now further look at the glenohumeral joint space. This is the joint space identified between the glenoid cavity and the humeral articular surface. It is important to distinguish between fractures of the anatomical and surgical neck, as blood supply to the main head fragment may be disrupted after fractures to the anatomical neck, and avascular necrosis in such scenarios is more likely to occur. Then we move on to assessing the scapula. With the scapula, we wish to identify the lateral border, the superior border, and if visible, the medial border. Once these borders have been assessed and identified, we then move on to checking the glenohumeral joint. We then move on to assessing the coracoid process, which is an important attachment point for the short head of the biceps brachii muscle, as well as many other thoracic muscles and ligaments. We then also need to identify the acromion. When identifying the acromion, we may as well also look at the acromioclavicular joint. We need to assess the body of the acromion, the joint space in the acromioclavicular joint, and the relationship of the acromioclavicular joint to the coracoid process. We then move on to assessing the clavicle. When assessing the clavicle, we start at the articular surface of the acromioclavicular joint and follow the outlines of the body of the clavicle throughout. Once again, we are assessing for any periosteal reactions, any evidence of fractures, and any other abnormalities that may be present. When describing a lesion of bone, we need to take into account the following parameters. The site, the size, the shape, the margin, the extent, the contents of the lesion, whether there's a periosteal reaction or not, and whether or not there may be evidence of healing. In this case, we can see a lesion situated in the proximal humerus. We can see that this lesion is roughly about two centimeters in diameter, and it's circular in shape. We can see that the margins of the lesion are quite sclerotic, and we can see that the lesion partially extends into the cortex. Once a lesion has extended into the cortex and compromised the integrity of the cortex, we now see this as a pathological fracture. We then assess the contents of the lesion. We need to describe whether the lesions are lytic or sclerotic in nature. Sclerotic lesions are hardened lesions which show up as hyperdense on x-rays. Lytic lesions, however, show up as hypodense on x-rays, as these may be filled with fluid, pus, or malignant tissue. We then move on to describing fractures of the humeral shaft. When describing any fracture, we need to assess the following parameters. Is there presence of tilt, twist, shift, or shortening in the fracture? 
Tilt describes the degree of angular displacement with respect to the most distal component of the fracture. Twist describes the rotational displacement of a fracture. Fractures with evidence of rotational displacement usually correlate with high energy injuries. Shift describes translation of the distal fracture segment in medial, lateral, anterior and posterior plane. Shortening describes a reduction in the distance between the proximal and distal margins of a bone. We then move on to assessing rotator cuff tears. Rotator cuff pathology is usually evident on ultrasound and MRI scans, but some X-ray features may be indicative of rotator cuff injury. Features evident of rotator cuff injury may be soft tissue swelling, narrowing of the subacromial space, a high rising elevated humeral head, and evidence of calcific emphysitis. We then move on to assessing the radiological features of osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Some of the findings that are in keeping with osteoarthritis are asymmetrical joint space narrowing, evidence of subchondral cysts, collapse and sclerosis, osteophyte formation, as well as other soft tissue swelling and deformity in the bone. Finally, we come to a very simple pathological feature which is glenohumeral subluxation. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something.